All right, guys, welcome back to the Steel Forum. I've got my uh, trusty companion, Matt Hand, back with me. Today, we're going to be talking about SDS2, some uh, internal, I don't know if you'd call it politics, but some changes there, going with the new CEO and some changes to their release schedule based on the quality or lack thereof, perhaps, of SDS2 2019. Kind of what that might mean, what it means for you, and what it kind of uh, makes us think about. So, all that coming up today on the Steel Forum. All right, Matthew, welcome back from your vacation. How was it? Oh, it was good. It was good. It was good. You had a lot of did fun. Did a whole lot of did a lot of kayaking. Got a lot, a lot of the matter. Got to hang out a lot with the family. Went out and right. did a whole bunch of stuff around here. Kind of a staycation, but lots of little day trips. So, all right, all right, well, it was that's fun. Something. Plus, you know, not detailing for a whole week. Yeah, yeah. You were you 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 missed the announcement that we're actually uh, planning on talking about a little bit and. Uh, it's funny because the thing that you're about to show, which is hilarious, is not one of the, you know, specifically talked about issues, but it's certainly an issue. It's kind of indicative of the problems that we're having with SDS2 lately. So you want to go kind of show it off to the... Yeah, so it ran into this today. I was working on teaching somebody how to put in anchor bolts. Okay, we were doing the, the sag rod tool. Okay, mm -hmm. now let's say we've already got it set up here, but... Let's say you've got an F1554-55 rod you want to use, right? Yeah, yeah. So you go up to grades. And I'm just going to tear this off because we're going to be in and out of this about 50 times. So then you click the round and square bars. And we fill this out. F1554-55. Sure. All right. So we're filling this out. Filling this out. I don't even care what these numbers are. It's all just gibberish at this point anyway. But hit all that. Hit OK. And then go in to change it. And it's not available. Oh, that's right. This is a custom member. That information loads when you load the model. So we're going to close and reopen the model. And we wait. And we wait. Now, bear in mind, this is while I'm in the middle of trying to teach somebody. So there's two people dead in the water for this whole adventure. Cha-ching. Okay. Cha-ching. Okay. So let me get back to the anchor bolts. Because I already know what happens here. Oops. I'm just set to member so it doesn't grab any other things. Okay. And, oh, it's not there. What happened? All right. Well, let's look. Oh, it's not there. Maybe you hit maybe you hit cancel instead of enter. Do it again. Yeah. Right, Fifteen fifty four. So you go through, you type it all in again, right? And I'll I'll type it in while I'm talking. So you you type it all in again, and you get to the end of it. You hit OK, and I'm not gonna reload the model because it's not gonna matter. But you'd go in, you edit this again, and sure enough, it's not there. So what is what it happened? you actually have to do? Like that, that seems well, I, like I want to take you through our whole process. Open it again, and I note this down here: steel grades are shared by plates, flat bars, round bars, and square bars. Well, then why isn't that all one setting? Okay. Why right. why are there multiple choices? Oh, okay, maybe it's some kind of a little quirk. Let's let's just go to plates. This is where we play our favorite game in SDS two. Find that setting. So we enter it all in again for plates. Hit OK. Still not there. OK. Forget doing it in the model. So we go out to the main menu, go to job options, get into this, try it from there. Same thing happens. It just never takes the input. So then I think maybe it's a bug. I know this has worked. So I go back, we go back to an older version. We've got 2018.14. We throw that up. We try it. Still doesn't work. 
so then we that's when we brought you in. We we decided to involve you in the process. I wanted to show you what was going on. And just as you come in, she's typing it again. And this time she's not if you notice, I'm clicking on all of these tabs. Sure. Right? Well, now she's got it figured out that she can hit tab. And she does that. And, oh, look, there's another column. Now, you notice there's no sliders. There was no way to indicate that there was another column there. Right. Fill and that out. And now. And then it sticks. It sticks for all of them. It's across the board in there. Right. And it's not just that you had to tab, right? It's that there's no visual indication that you can tab, right? There's no scroll bars put in there. Bug one, right? The first thing you do, you write a new interface, is you mush and unmush the screen and see what happens. Well, when that screen's mushed, it should throw up scroll bars or give some other visual indication that, hey, your screen is mushed. Fix this, right? Right. Now, Second, check this out. As uh, I mush the screen, okay, no scroll bars anywhere. If I drag this, I now get a vertical scroll bar. Right. But what I needed was a horizontal when I was mushed. It's entirely backwards from what we need. Right. If you drag down, does the scroll bar disappear? Like if you... Or if you make that so big that all the columns are visible. Right now, all the columns are visible. Or all the rows, sorry. Oh, I got you. Uh, let's try that. Maybe too many, but, you know. Oh, also, by the way, and I apologize for this, we're transmitting this on a 4K, so you're going to yeah. have to crush this down. I can't even stretch it in the vertical. Huh. Yeah. So... So, and it's not like we at some point shrunk this down and it's just been remembering this forever. As far right. as we can I, tell. I have been filling out three columns for this since the beginning of time, as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, right. that that's a new column and that's fine. You know, it, it provides more calculation variables and, and whatnot. this is a classic example of the lack of real testing that's going on at SDS2. Like a classic example, because there's so many... The first thing that you test is, hey, what happens if I leave these fields in the middle and don't finish filling them out, right? That's step one. Right. Is, hey, you've got invalid data, and I can only assume that step wasn't done because the answer to that question cannot be just ignore the fact that they put anything in at all. And let them go about their business. That's not it. right. And if you try to enter in a value of zero, it will complain. It will say, hey, you have to put in a value between here and here. But, but if, if you, you don't blank, enter anything nothing. in at all and it's blank, it'll let you click OK and it just deletes the data. Yeah, that's that's in no way acceptable. Right. I'm putting on my pop filter so you don't all hear my peas. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it, it's funny that I say but right after I talk about the pop filter. It's, I, every time I want to complain about these things, I can never remember all of them, right? As you experience them, you kind of gripe and complain about it. But then later when it's like, okay, can you document them? It's like, uh, well, at some point, you, as soon as we see them, we document them, but it, it, it's not my job. Like I'm here to make money detailing steel. Right. Right. If, if, if I was going to get paid a finder's fee for every brand new undiscovered bug that I could report, then I would record my day start to finish and I could play you back the tape wherever anything went wrong. Can you imagine how much that would cost them right now though? <laughs> Like legit, that would oh. it would it it would not be good. Would, not so just much. for all the like things that you click OK, and it does no error checking at all. It just kind of moves you on. Not even to, to mention the 
things where it should do different error tracking. You say like I, I like it when you you set something and it decides it's going to intelligently update your connection, and all of a sudden you have three inch bolts in your two row connection. Yeah. Now one of my favorites uh, is in the user defined connection. Like if you forget to actually select a user defined connection it throws you into a loop that is super annoying because what you want to do is say, Oh, I, I didn't mean to select a user defined connection. I meant to select, you know, shear tab or something like that. But what it makes you do is select a user defined connection first before it will right. stop popping that error message. Cause every try everything you try to do just repops that error message. Right. Right. And, you know, if you deal with like any of the custom members, if you do something that's stupid like that, it just pinks it out or grays it out, whatever the, you know, color it, it flags it. And you just can't move on. You right. can't click OK and close the member. Great. That's the error checking I need. I don't need you to throw me into an infinite loop of stupidity because I can't get out of this little issue. Right. And I'm. It always seems all those bugs, those little annoying things seem to happen when you're at your peak level of, I need this to go now. Oh, this yes. needs to go now. Yeah. The, the, the system has a way of knowing that you've received an angry email from somebody who's trying to accelerate the schedule. You know, yep. hey, I, I know that we're revising the drawings uh, but I need them yesterday, and why don't I have them yesterday, even though you just got the new contract drawings this morning? The, oh, the, I'll get right on that crash. The biggest thing, and I, I unfortunately have not tracked the data on this, so I can't say it with certainty, but it feels like piece marking has gotten considerably more fickle. You mean as far as losing piece marks in the middle of a job when you do something? Everything, everything yeah. we do, all of the piece marks change always. I think that's been in such an ongoing issue for so long. It's just sometimes you notice it more than others. The thing that always drove me nuts is you make a change to a member and now you have two different piece marks, right? Let's say you had two beams. You change one of yeah, them. This is one. This didn't used to be this bad. Yeah, but it, it's it's the way that it does this that drives me crazy is, okay, so you've got one B1 and you got two of them. You change one of them, it loses its piece mark. If that's all you did, then fine. But if you changed both of them, sometimes it will lose the piece mark of both of them, but they'll still have the same piece mark as each other. So you went from two 1B1s to two B underscore 159s. Why can't they stay 1B1s so that I can redetail them and keep all of that underlying drawing handy so that I can, you know, not have to rescrub the whole thing. I can set it to keep user annotations and whatnot. I would even be happier, right? I would understand if there was just a, 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 on the custom properties or properties or whatever else of that, a list of all the previous piece marks that this piece has been. So later when somebody says, oh, I need a detail for 7B4, and 7B4 doesn't exist anymore, I can go and say, okay, where's the piece that now represents what 7B4 was? Right. And it's, you, you know, can... I don't have to get out my Sherlock Holmes magnifier <laughs> and go oh, through old man. PDFs to try and figure out where 7B4 went to. Yeah, you're talking about that other school job we did not too long ago where I had to go and forensically back check three different reports because the customer kept asking for material summaries and they wanted to match piece marks as we changed things throughout the job. Yep. How come these don't match? I didn't want you to have that in the first place. It was in yep. progress and I knew it was going to do this. You can order all the material, but I can't promise that the piece marks will be the same when you get to the end of the job. Yep. And that's, that's where things go bad for us. It, it no longer, it used to attempt to keep the same piece mark. Now it has given up on that entirely and it just changes the piece mark. Right. Well, because it changes every time anything happens to it, it just throws the mark away and, yep. and moves it. To, so 
you put in an angle, it's A1. You put holes in that angle, A1 is now gone unless you make that A1 again, that exact same length of that material with no holes. You've added holes, now it's an A2. Now, if right. you cope it, it becomes an A3. You right. know, and Even every time you change something. another A3 doesn't exist, it still changes its piece mark. Right. And that's, it, I, it just, I, I think it's related to like um, preserving uh submaterial it was it was there was some reason that they did that but it's terrible it's so bad yeah it's it it for sure causes problems for us when we it's not so bad if you're the fabricator because fabricators when they've got you know their in-house detailers are much more understanding people i found yeah of detailing but when you're a subcontract detailer why did this piece mark change all you did was put a hole in it yeah, and that's, and I mean it's it's a valid gripe, but you know. right. Well, and it, it really it wouldn't be so bad too. Like if what happened was okay, we had thirty five angles marked A sixty four, and all thirty five of them got another hole added to them. They should right. all now be A sixty four, and that's that's not how it's going right now. But so we had some interesting discussion. Or an interesting happening while you were gone. Yeah, tell me all uh, about that. So, I'm, I'm as curious. you may know, we've got a new, at least ostensibly interim CEO. His name is Stuart Broom. Mm -hmm. And I, you know what? I think I have his LinkedIn because I want to see where he came from. Oh yeah, I, I do too. <laughs> because I don't, I don't recognize the name, right? Like it's not one that I've associated with. I feel like it's some kind of a somebody at consulting or something. I don't remember. Maybe it came from someplace else at. Yeah. So. He's. His, you know, his his headline is business management, P&L management, international sales management. Um, I wonder if his resume is on here. Okay, so he, he actually comes from Trimble. Okay. Interestingly enough, uh, he had been at SDS2 previously, but he came from, from Trimble. He was there for 17 years and apparently seven months. Uh, so right off the bat, there have been a lot of complaints about 2019, uh, a lot of them coming from me, that, hey, this isn't right. Um, right. And just... For the history, for anybody who might not know, one of the specifics for me is they added a new feature. The funny point, one of the funniest part about the new feature is they don't have a name for it. So it's the thing where you're in an erection view, you're, you're scrubbing your erection view, find a bearing plate, and you're like, oh, this needs to be wire, wire. instead of stick. Mm -hmm. Right? I need to see this. So in the new version, 2019 at least ostensibly you just select that piece and you right click and you save wire and poof it draws that thing okay and we were super excited about this feature it is an absolutely fantastic feature it's something that we've been complaining about for a long time and here comes the but the implementation of it was bad and like what again bad enough that it makes you shake your head because the problem is that now what it does when you select that and you right click and you say wire, what happens isn't it redraws that piece as wire. What it does is it basically, I'm explaining this as my understanding of it based on what happens, right? What it does is it goes back to the old detail erection view manually, toggles that piece, okay? and then reruns the view. Now, if you've right. ever rerun a view in SDS2, you know what's about to happen, right? You're going to lose your line work. Some of the stuff you added might be fine, right? Some of the stuff, but a lot of your line work is just gonna go away, just poof, gone. If you deleted stuff, that stuff's coming right back in where it was. And that's exactly what happens. Are you there? So you get all those... Okay wide flange beam member orientation indicators you turned off and anything. some of that stuff sticks so some the, sticks 
but the, when I'm talking line work, I'm talking about like you're scrubbing an erection view and you've got 16 lines overlapping. So you delete some to clear the view or you trim something or, okay, I got you, you know, like the for polygon instance, with, work. Yeah. With gratings, you go through and you get rid of all the extra lines and you just leave a, a pattern or, or whatever else. You know, if you've got railings crossing across each other and it gets confusing, sometimes you'll get rid of the dashed lines just to make it clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. All of that gets put right back where it was. Just as if you've rerun this view. And at first, like my, my initial impression was of it was, oh, this is this is a bug. But then I, I started when I was thinking about it, I was like, this is how they programmed it. Because that's very easy to program, right? You right. just basically say, okay, the just same way that you write a routine that already right, exists. Right. The same way that you write a variable when you're in detail erection view man manually, write that variable from here, and then just basically flash the screen and rerun the view. And that's why they did it that way because it's easy, right? It's easy to program. Somebody was like, oh, we can, boom, we can take care of this, no problem. But no. And so I, I reported the issue. I said, you know, this is, and I, I, I asked, I said, you know, this is how it's programmed, right? Like, this isn't something that you can just fix. Like, it's not just a little bug. It's to do it the right way is considerably more detailing work, or not detailed programming work. Programming, you have to, yeah. You have to rework how it looks at erection views. It needs to be actually dynamic, and it needs to look at it on a, at as an object by object basis. It can't just rerun the whole thing. And so that's that's where that is. And the, the real kicker too is that as a part of this reprogramming, and I don't know exactly what triggers it or how, I haven't been able to track down that bug, but it will poof while you're just scrolling around or you know messing around. It'll run that anyways just while you're doing stuff. And so... Whoa, 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 back up. What? Yeah. So you're just panning around in the drawing and it just... I, I can't that? necessarily say that panning is what does it, but you could be working in that drawing. Let's say, you know, you, you, uh, you detail, you know, clean up and you turn off MOI indicators for something. Mm -hmm. Something else will change when you do that. Oh no. Yeah. Oh no, no, yeah. no, no. So no, it's no, no. it's it's bad. And and the we were actually, you know, planning on so bit of history. Back at the NASCC, mm -hmm. I sat with Damon Skaggs and we recorded a, you know, 2019 intro video. Basically, here are the here are the features. But then we sat down and we used it and I was like, I can't release this video. 2019 doesn't work right. Like it doesn't work can't do it this way you're talking about now the uh, little unboxing video that we went to shoot one it, there was an a, an after one there was one that we did at the nascc with damon oh, okay. we sat in front of him and he, he demoed some features for us okay which you know i, I appreciate to no end it was great it was going to be a, a great feature but the next thing was because we I, I don't like to just jump up and down on sds2 right i don't like to do that i want to give them time work out their stuff you know, it is incredibly complex software. I get it. But eventually, like NASCC was April. Yeah. And it's, you know, August now. And we still don't really have a version that works. Um, so anyways, I was, I was complaining about that. You know, we were getting ready to kind of put out a video that basically said, hey, 2019 is a pass, right? It's a pass. Here are the reasons. Until they fix this, it's not. Uh, but before we, we we did, we got this this email, which is basic, which basically said, "Listen, I you know we got a new CEO, Stuart Broom. We took a look at all of your comments, not our comments, but the collective you know community's comments, the user base, about, sure, right, about this software and." It's, you know, the errors and bugs and that thing. And as a result, we've decided to pull 2019 and we're not going to release another one. 
the next version that you're going to see is going to be next year. It's going to be in 2020. It's going to be a 2020 version. And at that point, it it's a little conflicting, right? Because on one hand, great, right? You, you heard the message. We're not crazy about new features. We don't, not everybody's like, we have to have this feature. We have to have this. But universally, everybody wants the software to work better. Right. Right. Most people at this point are of the opinion that they would forego new features if we would just make the ones we've got work. If we could just get through the day without having something blow up. Um, and the question I had for you is, do you think that's an attainable goal for them? Like, do you think that with the, the, the elements that they have in place with the existing structure and the existing team, that's something that they know how to do? No, oh, man, that's tough. Um, right off the, ba the, the mean, bat, they need an interface expert. They absolutely right. need that, and they need somebody who's in charge of of alpha testing in a real way, right? Who right. understands that to to get this done, to to test something, you need to throw every possible ridiculous scenario at it. You have to assume that the user's number one goal is to break this friggin' software. Right. And your job is to prevent them from doing that. Right. Right. That That's, you know, I learned that in high school programming is the very first thing that you do after you design the initial interface, when you're, when you're testing, you, you start by testing to make sure that it works. And then you go back through and you idiot proof it. Right. What could somebody possibly do to break this? Number one thing, you know, if you're expecting an, an, an integer, make sure they're not typing in letters. Don't even make it physically possible. Disable those characters on the keyboard. Yep. If there's I mean, division being done, make sure zero isn't an option. Right. So, you know, the first thing you want to do is you want to just immediately go after that. Make sure that people can't put in impossible data. And then you want to make sure that you're getting complete data. So if they leave a field blank, there needs to be something that indicates before they leave, hey, you didn't fill this out. But you also wanna make sure that it's not obnoxious. So, you know, one, one thing that's always driven me nuts is you go to put in a plate and there's a thickness already filled out and there's a width already filled out. Well, if you wanna put in one inch plate and you type in one and hit tab and go to change that width to something else. Oh, no, no. The thickness must be the smallest value. You can't do that. Okay. Well, I was about to change the other value. Right. Keep me right. from Again. clicking okay. Yep. But That's you the can't... same issue with the, yeah. the user defined connection thing. It's like you, yeah. you got to know where to error check. And then when you get that message, you have to you have to take it to somebody who has no idea how to use this and let them try and use it and then watch what happens. Right, right. You know, first you go through and you, you try to bomb proof it and then you let the bomb go off. You take it to somebody and, you know, take it to a detailer. Seriously, put some detailers on your payroll for a, a year or two. Right, because they, they can't be beta testers. They can't be you and me. They can't be people who whose primary job is to do production work. Because yes, right. we, should be, we should be beta testers but the alpha testers need to be detailers that work for SDS2 and their entire job is to just tr work with the new features in ridiculous ways trying to produce stuff and right. see if they can break it. Right. Your goal is to try to break the software. All we're ever going to report is stuff that comes up accidentally, which, by the way, we shouldn't find anything at that point. Right. If we're attempting to use it as intended... Why are we ever finding any bugs? Right. The bugs that we find should be, you know, these series of integer values when all put together actually cause, you know, make some series of characters that cause a buffer overflow. Right. And, you know, poof, something bad happens. That's right. the kind of bug that we should find. You know, 
if you use a clip angle in the, the, the west face and a shear tab on the east face with a moment plate on the far side, two inches offset, then the whole thing turns into, you know, a, a, a Tickle Me Elmo doll. <laughs> it's exactly <laughs> it, that it's that kind of thing where it's, you know, a, a series of unfortunate events. That's the kind of testing right. that we should be, you know, as end users expected to find and report. Right. Right. You know, that was something I remember back in high school. I, I was writing a program. I was just writing a game. I was doing Monopoly. You know, that way I had ground rules already set and I just needed to code it myself. And everything worked in it with the exception of one thing that I handed it to somebody and, and they was they were playing through it and they found was if you went to jail by way of the community chest card or, you know, chance card or something like that, there was one specific way that you could go to jail would put you in an infinite loop that just sent your piece around the board, around the board, around the board, and would just crash it, you know. Right. It, but I had tested the go to jail feature extensively, I, you know, a, a, any other way that I could come up with to go to jail, but you had to roll a certain thing, and you know, it, something about the way that the variables interacted. I mean, this was 20 years ago. I don't remember it now, but I do remember that very specific bug, and it... it that's where you just need somebody to kind of happen across it. But I had so thoroughly tested everything else. That was the only thing they found. The right. game played all the way through. Well, and this is a, one of the problems I have is because I'm not on the users, you know, the, the was it the advisory, advisory board? board. So I don't know how this works, but my, my imagination, how I believe this works is user request feature, right? Writes up how they think it should work. And then that's handed to a programmer and they say, make this happen. And then the programmer goes through and makes it happen. And then poof, it's in the next release. The critical step missing in there is to hand it to detailer who didn't request this feature and say, here's this feature, try it out. Yep. But, well, you and, know, and that should actually another... happen too. That should, there should be a, a meeting of the minds before that to say, what buttons do you think you should press in what order? What value should you type in? Should you be typing in values at all? Or should it be a model, you know, a right. model interaction? Should there be a node that you can drag in? Everybody knows I want my nodes. Right. Well, that reminds me of, of something else, too, is, you know, just because one detailer asks for it and it's simple doesn't mean it's something that you should do. Right. And because that's, we had that issue actually, with weld symbols. Yeah, that was the number two reason why we were going to say don't use SDS2 2019 because you can't use simultaneously an other side weld and an all around symbol. And you also can't provide a size or effective throat of a square groove weld. Both things that are wrong, right? Both of those situations right. come up. Both of those situations can exist. They're not necessarily common. Right. And you know well, we we size our groove welds. Right, right. We our size we welds. size our cat plate groove welds, and so that right off the bat was like, what the heck's going on here? And you know, if you've got a uh, what is it, one of those continuity plates in an HSS column, yep. where the column goes up, cuts off, there's a plate, and then more column on top. That's a double sided all around, all around fillet well. weld, and right. you can't do it. Now, you know, yeah, you can draw another leader, but why are we being prevented from putting in what would a otherwise be the symbol. correct weld symbol? Right. right. Because somebody and, said, hey, I don't like that. That shouldn't be there. Right. Right. And I can't imagine that that made its way through the advisory board, that somebody, you know, that that feature was proposed. It was taken to the advisory board and said, hey, do we want this? And everybody said, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do it. I can't imagine that's the case. I, I wouldn't believe it. No. Yeah. So I mean, so if it were me, if I if I were in Stuart's position, I would be looking for an employee, I you know, either internally or externally, who has both of the the respectability amongst his peers and the the knowledge to basically say, okay, here's how bug testing is going to work from now. Don't bring me a product until it friggin works and it's not getting past me until it does right it just 
and it's it's got to work not against somebody who understands the instructions and is using it as intended, but it's got to work for the guy who is trying to destroy the world just to watch it burn. <laughs> right, because you know you also have to remember that while we may not be trying to do that the design team is, you know, we could put in stuff that the design team throws at you and you're just plugging it in. Yeah. You know, they, they can absolutely call for stuff that doesn't work. And then it, it blows up the system. I mean, it's not even that it just says no. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, another, a classic example, which I'm, fairly confident is still in existence i know it is in 2018 but i don't know other versions you know you draw an arc the entire volume of that arc all the way to the centroid of the center of the of the circle is draggable right so it, if it you try to click on anything within the area of that circle or of that arc you're moving that arc so you right. can't grab anything else how did that make it through testing? How? I I can't even imagine. Right? It's it's crazy. Um, and there's there's a bunch of stuff like that. And there's a bunch I you know, I'm always uh, always hammering on it, but there's there's stuff too that while it works, it doesn't work the way that it should. Right. Trim the trim tool is a classic example of it. Unless you use the trim tool all the time, it doesn't work right. You, the steps that you would take to trim a line being a normal person are not the steps that you have to follow to trim a line in STS-2. Right. Right. If, if you go back and you try it in AutoCAD, it's intuitive. Yep. It, if I told you what the command was, just type in trim, you will get the line trimmed the way that you want without having to read any documentation on how to use the tool. Right. And it's got the proper visual feedback. Right. That was something I could never understand is, you know, you get in the drawing editor and you lose your mind. But, you know, coming as I, I started out as an AutoCAD detailer, and it's like, why? Why is it when this is available? Did nobody ever just say, hey, let's buy a copy of AutoCAD and write everything in here that we can ourselves? I imagine it's for, you know, copyright reasons. There's some stuff that they just, if they well, duplicate you can't, it too you can't closely. steal the code, but you can make the feature. I mean, you don't have to call it donut, right? Whole, of course, but, right. you know, it's. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much of that stuff is a, a legal. I'm hoping, anyways, that it is, that there's. Because otherwise, man, just freaking go in and make it work right just follow follow autocad's example because they've done it right they've got right interface people and that's that's the next thing like again if if, if i'm stewart and i'm looking around at what needs to happen here they need to hire an interface expert not a guy who can do interfaces but an interface expert somebody who's going to know okay this is where people are going to want to click this is how it should look this is intuitive this is not. The interface in STS-2 is a disaster. A disaster. And you can be trained to use it. But right. nobody sitting down to use STS-2 is going to follow the steps that you have to follow to make things happen. Right, right. You have to spend a lot of time with the documentation. And a lot of times the documentation is poor. Right. So, every, you know, that, that's the thing we go I through a lot with our employees program, is, you know, figure it out. Say we that have again. to tell we go through that a lot with a lot of our employees as we're trying to train is, you know, we just kind of have to throw them at something and say, figure it out because you're going to run into a lot of features where that's the case. We'll get a new feature and there's no documentation on it and it's not coming, you know, so we have to sit there and mess with it and see. What changes when I add in this variable? Because X and Y for services com connection component wasn't what we thought it was going to be, you know, or, or the X offset moved it, but then always set the number back to zero. Like there was a lot of figuring it out because there's no documentation for that. Right. right. Great tool for what it is, but 
you can't just sit down and understand how it works by opening it, even you know if it had pictures. Yeah, I would even go as far as to say it's an unparalleled tool. Yeah, I have, there's I've nothing never that seen operates one like it that has that power in it and that much ability to make our lives as detailers better. But because its its interface was written by a programmer, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't. It's it's unintuitive. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just as guilty as anybody, but I, I'm not running a software company. Like, I write a parametric, and, yeah, there's a button over here in space that you press it, and it makes the whole thing work. But I know that button's there, but they don't. But this is, this is a, you know, professional software company. They can't right. do it. That's, that just can't be the way of it. So, like, they, they need to hire somebody and start looking at the interface. I mean, if you look this is something I harp on constantly. If you look at the member edit screen, it is completely disorganized. It's just a page of stuff and you can just scroll through it. And, you know, too, if you shrink that window, it does not behave the way it should behave. There's, there's, there's space where there shouldn't be space. There's no space where there should be. It's not organized. It doesn't, you know, spring back at the right spot it doesn't even limit you to okay you can't make this any smaller than this that's a we just can't fit all the stuff we need in there it'll just keep making it smaller right until well i mean it, mine is basically maximized on a 4k monitor and you still can't see everything right no you have to scroll yeah that's <laughs> that's crazy you know but there's... You, you get into any of those custom members like railings beautiful Right, right. Give, give the the member, you know, the basic beam edit screen the same treatment as, as custom members, and we're good. Yep, we're we're in great shape. Hey, here's a tab for the left end. Here's a you know a tab for the connection to the sub tab, left end, right end. Yep. And it goes. Yeah, that there. that would go a long way. I I mean, it it seems like too a, a lot of the issue. Like it, it's still. Right. Even though they've updated it to, to start using, you know, your, your GPU, it's still not modern. It like, why doesn't it run gaming rendering sorts of a thing? You know, it. Yeah, it is. It is really strange. It just it's seems strange. like it could be done so much better and could be rendered that's, better. It that, could operate that too, smoothly. That's a separate like that's a ground up build. Right, and that's what I'd like to see. I wouldn't mind not getting a new version out for a couple of years if I was at the end of that wait to yeah. get SDS three. But it's here's re- the next question: it's a whole new engine and everything. Would you pay your support fees for those years on just good faith that when they come out the other side, it's going to be fixed? Because that's that was the first question that I asked. When I got, okay, we're going to wait a while and then we're, we're going to produce a version. And I, I go to myself, well, that's not my fault. Why am I, why am I continuing to pay right. for your Well, and, that, and that's mistakes. what they're doing now. I mean, it, at this point, there's no 2019. And 2018, the, um, what is it, the, the general release isn't the latest release and there have been better releases of 2018 since the general ones with critical bug fixes right right critical improvements that you need to have you need to be in 2018.18 so if we stopped paying our support fees because we're not going to get a 2019 general we're back to an old 2018 that's missing critical bug fixes And there's no way to lock it in. There's no, I get everything up to the 2019 general release. Right. And, and that's the thing is the, the question the user base has to ask is, do we have faith in SDS two in the next, let's say six months, four months, isn't realistic, right? Let's say six months to step back and give us a 2020 release even with no new features that's stable and 
I, I almost can't even ask for the interface to be intuitive, right? That's no. because that's an improvement, right? Right. So just right. to overhaul the interface, you're looking at a couple of years for a complete rebuild of the software. Right. I just, you just, just stability. And to me, that includes the database engine fix, right? It, it, it can't continue to be this million bits of small files. Yeah, it's, it needs it's to be gotta a singular be, database It's got to be the new engine with the with actual like modern database structure. Right, and updating the licensing system. I mean, you're owned by the same company that's got Bluebeam, and Bluebeam licensing works great. Well, the message that I got on the licensing system was very much no. Right. It's, and it's not- I got to say, honestly, the reason for that has to be because with the ability to do it the way that it's done with Bluebeam, you would be able to much more easily get remote systems running without problems. Right. And since initially, you know, when it was just cloud synergistics, they didn't have any issue with that. But now that they're peddling their own remote setup with Edge, there's no financial incentive to them at all. Right. And I, I mean, honestly, I got to believe the only way that we could get this improved is if we went ahead and made it very public for free knowledge. Here's how you do remote systems the way that we do them. Go cry to everybody about, you know, go cry to your support rep and your your um, sales rep that, hey, I need this to be better with the licensing. Because I'm yeah. not doing it the other way. Right. Because... Edge costs hundreds and hundreds of dollars, right? That service right. is... Per user, per month. Right. Our way does not, and it is every bit as it's it's more... It's 100% scalable. There is zero upfront cost, and the monthly cost is considerably lower, all with right. performance that's on par or better. Then right. The with only with four users, we're paying like what twenty cents an hour per user. Yeah, something like that. I think it's thirty now because we Is it 30? we went to a kind of upgraded system. Oh, okay. Um, but it's and it doesn't even have to be that. Like that's because the the reason we have to use the upgraded system is because we need a feature because of that, those million small files. So we need that speed. If it was a a classic database structure, Mm -hmm. not doing all of those read and writes of a thousand tiny files, then we don't, we we could save on top of that. Okay. Um, But now it really is the problem. Like I, I didn't have any, you know, problem with it when cloud synergistics was their own company and they, they found their own solution to this. But now right. with it kind of being intermingled with Edge, now it looks anti-competitive right. to continue this, this licensing software the way it is. Because there's, right. no, there's no reason for it. It's bad software. Everybody knows it's bad software. Mm-hmm. So, and our way, our way absolutely works. It, it, we, we use it every day on lots of projects. In, right. it, it well, I'm sitting on it right now. So I I should probably point that out when we do a video and we're sharing the screen, that's me sharing the screen to Nick so that he can record it and I'm viewing it remotely. That's not my local screen. Right. And you've got the, well, actually Jason's got the worst connection. He's got a DSL (laughs) connection and it still works fine for him. Right. At 4k resolution. And that's right. It's it, it, that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest thing that slows you down. Running in 4K, but we like 4K. So, well, you need 4K if you're going to have that member edit screen up, right? right. <laughs> and it's it's easy to set. Like we have, and and the other thing is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to sell our way because we don't make any money off it, right? You know, right. It, the the couple of people have asked me how we do it. I explain to them step by step. This is what we do. There's no profit in it for us. Um, but I completely lost track of what I was saying. 
poof. There it goes. <laughs> The, yeah, the only the only complicated step is getting the hasp to go through and get, you know, to pretend as if it's up there in the cloud. Right. And there's some latency that that adds and SDS2 checks for that license constantly. And right. we've tested it with a local license versus a, you know, remote. That's what's going on. It is checking for that hasp constantly. Even for people on local machines, you are suffering. Your software is slower because of that Flex LM licensing. Right. And that, to me, is, is not acceptable. They need to get rid of it. It's terrible. Right. If you edit a member, it checks the license. If you run verify and fix, it checks the license. If you process, it checks the license. You detail a member, it checks. If you detail a member, I think this was part of the issue we had before with it. Um, when you detailed a bunch of members at once because it runs on multiple threads. Yep. It's trying to check the license on multiple threads at once and it has a stroke and crashes. Yep. And that was something that we had to get fixed for, I think that was one of our critical fixes for 2018.18 because we had to detail one member at a time. That was the only way we were getting it done. Yep. And it was a flex LM problem. That's, that's it. And it's not just, it's the, the need to have this stupid little hasp. Like every once in a while, I, you know, I want to take the laptop and, and go out. I don't want to bring a hasp with me. I don't want to, you know, if, if, I, if I've got a license free, let me use it wherever I want to. It's, it's, right. it's 2019 now. Like, right. So, you know, we've got a network license and it's got, what do we have now? Four license, four stations at this point. So if three people are working on the remote, we have that network license that holds the four licenses. You can't peel somebody off and have them go work remotely or work, well, work remotely, but work on their own local station. So, you know, if if we've got our one guy, Jason, with a terrible Internet connection, he goes down, he's down. Yep. But if he had his own HASP with our license, then he'd be working. Well, when you're talking Bluebeam. Just unregister one of the machines, one of our, you know, uh, remote machine stations, essentially, and re-register it on his, and he's back up and running. He can go work locally, you know. Yeah. If he's got a five-minute window where, you know, his internet will work, he can transfer the file through, he gets going, he's up and running for the day, and he'll get back to us at the end of the day. Hopefully, they fix his internet. Right. But... I mean, a system like that would also cut our costs considerably because if we're going to be working on a project locally, like if it's just you, all right, peel the hasp down for a minute and work on your own machine for a couple hours and re-upload when you're done. Right. No we don't all have to work together. We can all work on independent projects. And then when we have a big project, everybody pulls back in. Yeah. But you know, because the remote costs only when it's running. It's not like, you know, these other services where it's always on and you pay when it and that's, you know, starting to get where you get people are doing this whole follow the sun business model, which is drives me up the wall is, you know, you get people that pride themselves on. Oh, well, we only use American detailers, but then you find out, well, we're American detailers during the day shift, but that license is bought and paid for all night long. So overseas it goes and we're remote so yep well we just shut down at the end of the day right and there are people building servers for exactly that purpose in their office and right. i, I it, it's strange for me because i i really do i really think that it's it's bad business to take your work overseas um not it, it's not bad business it's just bad ethically right like the to, to pay somebody a buck to do it overseas. Right. I, I, I don't want to get into it too much though, because it's not, <laughs> it, it, it's not what we're about. Um, you know, I, I know people that have counter arguments. I'm just not one of them. I'm a bear, but you know, I buy American cars. I, I, I try not to shop at Walmart. Like I want, I want that. That's something that's important to me, but I, it's not important to other people. And I get it. I don't, but I'll pretend yeah. I do. But, you know, we do get asked that a lot too. You know, we, the, people find out that we've got remote systems. You get a, a potential customer and they say, well, are you all local? Are you all in America? You know, and you got to wonder how many times do people 
just lie. Right. Well, I, I can tell you that a good portion are. And if they've got, and this is this is the thing, if they've got good quality control, if their drawings are still getting checked and all of that stuff by people who are competent and who can, you know, release at the same quality level as an American detailer, then who am I really to give them a hard time about it? Right? They're still producing what the, their customer needs. Right. Well, to me, the problem is that's somebody playing by a different set of rules. You know, we have minimum wage and a competitive workforce. So, you know, one, I'm not going to be able to find anybody here willing to work for minimum wage as a detailer. But, you know, when you can find somebody willing to make five to ten dollars an hour because of where they live and you're willing to take advantage of that, you know, where does that put you ethically? To say, well, I'd rather not give somebody here a job because I'd have to pay them a fair amount. Right. And ultimately, it's, I, I think it's a globalism question, you know. Yeah. But we've got regulations and, and decency and stuff like that here that they just don't have. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, overseas detailers aren't decent as people. I'm saying that employers treated decently by their employer to treat them decently i'm sure some pay competitively for the environment but it's not competitively versus versus an american competent you know skilled detailer so but you know on the other side of that coin why do these you know people just by virtue of living in another country not deserve a job if they're willing to work for less so that's it's it's a long discussion it's it's never gonna end but we're way, way off the point. So I, I think we'll wrap this up by saying, you know, we're excited to, to that, you know, they've acknowledged the problem that there's too many errors and that what we're seeking is a program that works. I do have right now real concerns that without some additions to their staff and some basically – and. You know, you could hire us. We'll we'll work hourly. We're, you know, we're nice guys like that. Uh, but without additions to their staff, we're actually not qualified in any way. Um, to to really put a lock on that testing pro, you know, process and say this is how it has to. You know, until we've thrown these thousand scenarios at it, it's not tested yet. It's not ready yet. It can't. It's not alpha ready it's not beta ready nobody in the public gets to see this it's just not done yet and that needs to include documentation it is that feature does not go live to anybody outside the sts2 organization until it is documented until there's a help file right and a good one right because yes this is a complicated process and this software is always going to be complicated but they they do they do need to do better, um, right? Well, and for as complicated as it is, you can't just go into it blind and use the "I'll figure it out" mentality. You have to have documentation, right? Yep. And, you know, and we ran into this when we when you initially started it, trying to do the 2019 video. Is there was no documentation? I think you were trying to use that magnifier tool, and then you called them, and their tech support didn't know anything about how it worked either. Yeah. You know, it, it was a whole project. We had to put a pin in the entire video, which I don't think we've to this day ever even released one, which you know now we won't. But, you know, it, what, it's, what's going it's on? It's sad, though, too, because that magnifier is a great tool. Right. It, it has great potential. But how do yep. you use it? It's not done. It's, it's crazy. And, you know, throughout the program, right, there are constantly places where you need to access something buried in the settings to fix the thing that you're doing. And support instantly will tell you to, you know, go find that setting. So you got to go back to the main menu or close the window or whatever else. Every time that's a situation, there needs to be a dot, dot, dot button 
that lets you get that. If I if I'm in the base plate, you know, if I'm selecting a base plate and the one that I need isn't there, the the fact that I've got to close that, open up a different window, go to a different Ugh. dialog box to get that, that's ridiculous. You're talking to basic cat plate schedule? Right. That's crazy. Yeah, you, you should be able, be able to add to that from that the screen. Right now. This yep. isn't, you know, Windows 95 where you need to, well, it kind of is, but that's that's ridiculous like if if there's something i need to if if you're adding anchor bolts and the grade that you see or that you need isn't on the list you need to be able to get to that grade list from that same window without going off yep. into a ridiculous space at the bottom of that list needs to be add a grade yep. every time every time same thing with the material file if i go if i go to add a joist in and the joist size that i want isn't in there Right. The joist size you have specified does not exist. Would you like to add it? And yes or no, say yes, because you typed it in correctly and it's just not there. Right. Bring up a field. Let me fill out the data, put that into the material editor file and load it into the model so that I don't have to close anything. Just let me move on with my day. Yep. I just needed a joist with this number on it so the approver doesn't gripe. And even even if you've got to pull some wizardry because of the outdated system, right? Be where normally you'd have to reload the model. Even if you tell me, hey, you know, we'll save this information for you, and the next time you reload the model, we'll pop that piece in there. Okay, I can live with that, I guess. But you got to do something. You got to those settings need to be accessible right away. You know. It, we could go on forever, right? But we should we, could. we should wrap up on this. I've one. only got 40 minutes left till I have to leave, so, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's it. It's I So, I you know, I I've, I've kind of got mixed feelings. I'm excited that they've acknowledged the problem and that they've got somebody at least ostensibly new at the helm who will probably or hopefully be looking at these issues. Um but I am I am nervous that we end up waiting for 2020, like patient, good little children. And then it's just, they, they fix the bugs that they were completely aware of. They, you know, they fixed some bugs, but didn't really get everything done or they just continued business as usual. So you say, you know, my fear is that they go, just... my fear is that they take the, uh, the sales driven approach and just try to put in more features instead of fixing anything. It seems like that's what they've done in 2019, and I hope that they really realize that that is not an acceptable path forward. Yeah. All right, guys, that's it for this episode. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or kind of want to chime in on the conversation, please leave those comments down below. Uh, we would love to hear from you on what you think the future of SDS2 is looking like. Uh, also, in a couple weeks, speaking of the future, we are going to be at the SDS2 Users Group Conference in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, we hope that you will be in attendance. If not, we hope that you'll kind of tune in. We'll have a lot of uh, content coming for you over those couple days. A lot of it's going to be live. Some of it's going to be uh, recorded. And some of it, they are going to be recording those this year. Uh, through Zoom and then posting them later. I don't know how long that process will take, but that is getting done. Uh, so we look forward to that. Matt and I will both be presenting. Matt's going to be presenting on components, some of the more powerful ones and how to use them. And I will be pre presenting on what I call SDS2 hacks, ways to make the system do what you did not, what it does not necessarily want to do uh, to get those connections, to get those situations handled that SDS2 just does not know how to handle. So if you have any tips on that, please let me know so that I can make my presentation as interesting and useful as possible. And as always, we'll see you back here. Beautiful.